people are beginning to change. And everyone unprepared for this will also change. The Bible says that a time will come before the return of the Lord when believers and unbelievers begin to change so that their lifestyles and personalities go against everything they were meant to be. The world will call this progressive, but according to the Bible, it is a sign of the end, a final trap to destroy lives forever. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1-4, through 4, according to the Amplified Version, says, But understand this, that in the last days, dangerous times of great stress and trouble will come, difficult days that will be hard to bear. For people will be lovers of self, narcissistic, self-focused, lovers of money, impelled by greed, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, and profane, and they will be unloving, devoid of natural human affection, callous and inhuman, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, devoid of self-control, intemperate, immoral, brutal, haters of good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of sensual pleasure rather than lovers of God. Child of God, we are in these days as spoken of by the Word of God. Although many people still doubt the veracity of the Bible, it steadily confirms that it is indeed the Word of God, a prophetic and instructional manual for living in much more than a historical book. You see, the Word of God was written by men, but not by them alone. It is a Spirit-inspired book. Hence, its actual author is the Holy Spirit, the one who inspired each writer. Despite their differences in time, background, relationship to one another, and location. But we are not here to tell you about the Bible, but about one of its prophetic pointers of the last days before the return of the Lord Jesus. Remember that when Jesus ascended after his resurrection, two angels appeared to his disciples and told them in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. From that day, each moment of our time on earth draws us closer to when the Lord will return. Once he came into the world as a little baby, the Lamb of God who carried the sins of the world on himself and died on the cross to save all humanity. But when he comes again, he will be coming not as that baby, but as the Lion of Judah, as the Lord and Judge. He will return as the Redeemer of his people from the evil and darkness of this present age. While on earth, Jesus said that no one would know when this would happen, not the Son or the angels in heaven. Only the Father knows when the end will happen. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. It took understanding the scripture for me to know that when the Bible says his coming will be like a thief in the night, it didn't mean that Jesus' return would occur at night. Looking back now, it's funny to think that I believed this as a child. So each night as I went to bed, I'd pray and ask forgiveness for all my sins during the day. In my mind, Jesus would only return in the night. So I didn't want to wake up and be left behind. But I learned that what the Bible meant was that just like no one ever expects a thief to invade their homes when they do, the Lord's return will be as unexpected. Therefore, thief in the night is more about the unexpectedness of Christ's return than the time. According to God's word, only God the Father knows the time. When that time comes, he will issue the command. And the Bible says that the trumpet will be sounded and God's people will be taken away from this world, both the living and the dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 52 says, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. But please listen to me. One of the signs the Bible says will precede this time is that people will begin to change. Our opening text reveals this point by point, and we can see this happening before our eyes today. Doesn't this tell you that the time is closer than we know? People have become more concerned about themselves than ever. 
The concept of love today has moved steadily away from everything the Bible says and everything it is meant to be to self-centeredness. As long as they feel good, most people no longer care about how their actions affect others around them. If they are unhappy, no one should be happy. If they are depressed, any happy person around them must pay for it. If they are wrong and hurt people, they blame everyone else. Telling the truth is now referred to as being judgmental. People are turning away from truth, kindness, and good virtues for the love of money without regard for their souls or their actions' effects on those around them. I once read of a child suffering abuse and mockery among his friends in school because they found his mother on a website used primarily by sex workers who produce pornographic content. This revelation shocked this young child so much that he became depressed and suicidal. However, when another celebrity who created content on the platform was asked for her thoughts if she found herself in the same situation, she said it was no big deal. She believed that no matter how her child felt, he could cry all he wanted in the expensive cars and possessions she bought with the money from such business. This is how deep love for self and love for money have eaten their way into many people today. The hearts of people are more hardened now with greed, pride, arrogance, and a deliberate lack of reverence for all authorities and for God. People worship celebrities, money, fame, talents, demons, entertainment, and technology. The sad thing about all these things is that it would have been one thing if these were just actions of unbelievers in the world. But right now, even believers are beginning to change. Many people who were once Christians have been sucked into this whole thing with the rest of the world. You may have noticed this, but consider the relationships between the older and the younger generations of Christians today. Do young people hold any respect for older people now like they used to in the past? Are people now so bold that young ministers believe they know better than older ministers? Young children at home tell their parents to their faces how bad they are at parenting simply because they weren't given the liberty to do as they pleased. And what does the world do? They applaud them. I remember coming across a video of a famous preacher telling his congregation that he wished he could talk to God about changing his narrative to suit different gender identities than the ones already pointed out in Scripture. Although I was surprised, the truth is that the Bible already told us that in the last days, people will start changing. Dear believer, it will be sad to realize that, without knowing, you can fall into the trend changing people into who they aren't and after things God does not want us going after. The Bible tells us that although a path may seem reasonable, the end is not guaranteed to be good. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Listen, the whole world going after something and it feeling right to do it, do not make it right. Even if the preacher you respect the most supports it, if the Word of God is against it, stand with the Word of God. Someone once rightly said, it is better to walk alone than with a crowd going in the wrong direction. You need to remember that God does not make mistakes and has an ultimate purpose for your existence. Your life is meant to glorify His name in one way or another. Not only so, but you need to also remember that although you are in the world, you are not of the world. In other words, through your faith in Jesus Christ, you have been called out, separated from this world. You are not going where they are headed any longer. You shouldn't follow their culture any longer. Why? because you now belong to a new family and a new kingdom. You are first a citizen of God's kingdom and a member of His family before you are of your natural origins on earth. Again, I repeat, God does not make mistakes and you are a citizen of His kingdom. Whoever wants to convince you otherwise or encourages you to walk in any way that does not agree with what the Bible says, whoever tries to tell you it is okay to embrace anything that goes against God's command has one aim, to change you into what you are not. In these last days, you must stand against it. You must stand your ground. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass, but the word will not. 
Whoever builds their life on the Word and the instructions of the Word of God will not be carried away with the trends of this world, but will be solid and unmovable in these last days. Beloved, don't let anything or anyone change you. It may be difficult, and this choice may often place you in difficult situations. Still, it will be the safest place to be, knowing that when you meet the Lord, you will hear those words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Don't you want to hear those words from the Lord? Some people may hear the opposite. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. They may reply that they did so many things in his name, but identifying with the Lord's name is not enough if you do not submit yourself to his ways. You are bound to become more like what you present yourself to. If you submit yourself to godliness and righteousness, you'll become more and more like Christ. But even if you claim to be a believer, if you then offer yourself to ungodliness and disobedience to God's instructions in His Word, you'll become more and more like the world. And the Bible tells us that when we become friends with this world, we become enemies of God. God is giving you these words today to invite you to embrace your identity in Him. You are a new creature, the apple of God's eye. You matter so much to the Lord. He loves you and is willing to forgive your sins if you turn to Him and seek His help to serve Him. He invites you to hang on to the truth of what His Word tells you, not how you feel or what people say around you. Keeping in step with the Word of God, we will be able to maintain our identity in Christ until He comes again. So, continue to read your Bible. Continue to value the truth and instructions of the Word above what anyone else says. Don't let go of God, my friend. He is your salvation. Do you know that some people will be left behind after the rapture? What will happen to them? Who are these people? Why will they be left behind? But before we go any further, let's first understand what the rapture is. The rapture is an event in the future where God takes all believers from earth. This sets the stage for God's judgment during a time called the tribulation. God will bring all believers who've died back to life, give them new perfect bodies, and then take them from earth. The living believers will also receive new perfect bodies and will be taken at that time. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-17 that, For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. It's really important to mention that the word rapture isn't found in the Bible. The term comes from a Latin word meaning a carrying off, a transport, or a snatching away. The idea of the rapture is clearly taught in the Bible and is supported by many scriptures. This topic is very sensitive, but also crucial because we must consider how ready we are for the rapture. It also helps us to align ourselves and examine our hearts based on God's eternal word to see where we need to make changes. As we go through this discussion, our main scripture will be from John 3.18, which says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. The Bible tells us that those who believe in Jesus Christ are not condemned, but it's a different story for unbelievers. They're turning away from God's only solution for their sins. By rejecting God's greatest gift and not believing, they're adding to their sins and calling God a liar. Unless these people change their ways and believe in the gospel, they'll face condemnation. This is a call for everyone to accept Jesus Christ as the perfect sacrifice for sin and avoid the condemnation that awaits those who turn down this offer of salvation. Now, let's look at a few groups of people who will be left behind after the rapture. The first group is the undecided. Some people are closed off to the message of salvation no matter how much they hear about it. They won't make a decision to follow Jesus even if they hear powerful sermons or messages. What's interesting about this group is that they keep delaying their decision for the Lord, as if they control their own lives. They know deep down that Jesus is the only way to God, 
yet they won't accept his sacrifice by making him their Lord and Savior. This group includes many churchgoers, people who were born and baptized in the church, and even the children of pastors and other church leaders. They know the gospel, but deny its power to save them from their sins. It's interesting to note that the people in this group never make a meaningful decision to follow the Lord in their lifetime. Some mistakenly believe the rapture's already happened, while others think it's just a religious fantasy meant to keep people in fear. They're the ones the scripture warns us about, who say things like, our ancestors told us about the rapture, but it hasn't happened yet. It's been ages. The Bible calls them scoffers. They ask when the Lord will return, forgetting that He is patient, hoping for everyone to repent and not perish. Their indecision will lead to them being left behind. Think about the story of the ten virgins in Matthew 25, 1-13. They're like the five foolish virgins who had lamps but no oil to light them. When the bridegroom arrived at midnight, they had no oil. While they went to get more oil, the bridegroom came and took the five wise virgins. Procrastination is very dangerous when it comes to making decisions about your eternity. Many people will be left behind on account of procrastination and indecision. Some young folks believe that they'll enjoy their 20s, 30s, and 40s, and then they'll decide when they get to their 60s. But this isn't wise, because your life is not in your hands. This is one of the devil's tricks to deceive people into eternal damnation. I want you to know, people die every day, both good and bad, sick and healthy, young and old, rich and poor. No one's promised the next day. If you already know and are convinced in your heart that Jesus came to this world and died for the sins of the world, there's truly no point in being undecided about your decision to follow Jesus. You can make the decision today and be on the path to eternal bliss. Or you can keep procrastinating, which is extremely dangerous because you cannot know when the trumpet will sound. The second group is the holier than thou. This is also known as the self-righteous group of people. What does it mean to be holier than thou? It means being so convinced of our human perfection rather than embracing Jesus' perfection that's freely given to us by faith. It is painfully true that those who believe in their self-righteousness will be left behind after the rapture. This category of people rely on their holier-than-thou attitude, behavior, and sacraments more than they believe in Christ's finished work on the cross at Calvary. One thing that's very common with people in this category is that they rely on human effort rather than divine grace. They don't see salvation from the standpoint of grace. They see it by works. Their attitude is closely related to the Pharisees in Jesus' days. Throughout the New Testament, Jesus pointed out their holier-than-thou attitude, which made them look good, but deep within, they were weighed down by the sin of self-righteousness. They stood on the ground of things like how long they prayed, how often they fasted, how much they gave, how regularly they attended worship, and how frequently they attended to the poor and needy in society. While all these acts are great for every child of God, it's more important that we know that nobody can rely on these things to be saved. Isaiah 64, 6 says, All of us have become like the one who's unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Self-righteousness is a deadly mirage that deceives many folks into the belief that they can be saved through their own merit. These individuals reject God's saving grace in Christ Jesus, which leads them to being left behind on the day of rapture. Ephesians 2, 8-9 reconfirms to us that, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Self-righteousness creates a heart that is usually far from God and filled with pride, judgment, and a very critical spirit that disconnects them from the real blessings of God's grace. No holier-than-thou person will be raptured because of their trust in their own merit instead of Christ's finished work. Rather than holding on to this very thing that disqualifies you, why not embrace God's grace through faith in Christ Jesus and forsake arrogance? God's grace is wonderful in that there's nothing you do that qualified you for it. This is why so many will not be raptured. 
it sounds too simple to be true. And this leads us to the last group I want to share with you. The third group is unbelievers. In contrast to popular opinion, the sin that takes people to hell is the sin of unbelief. Unbelief is what I consider to be the greatest evil on earth. Who is an unbeliever? An unbeliever is anyone who refuses to place their faith in Jesus Christ. This group is destined to be left behind after the glorious rapture. People who don't believe are already condemned according to John 3.18. These are people who remain resolute about the rejection of God's offer of salvation. They erroneously reject Christ's divinity as false. They've come to a willful conclusion about their stance on Jesus' sacrifice. This willful denial is what keeps their name out of the book of life. By this denial, they have closed the doorway of God's mercy upon themselves and are now marked for eternal condemnation. This is why they'll be left behind after the rapture. It's impossible to willfully reject God's gift of salvation without the damning consequences of eternal hell. This is one truth many people don't want to admit today. There's practically nothing that can be done to anyone who dies without believing in Jesus. In fact, there's nothing like purgatory. Purgatory is a deception. It's not biblical and remains a religious fantasy. Praying for the dead is as good as fetching water with a basket. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.10 about the importance of being reconciled with God. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Those who don't believe will have to deal with the terrible result of rejecting the Savior. Even though God loves everyone, His love won't let everyone be taken up in the rapture because they've already had the chance to accept His best offer. The rapture is only for those who have been cleansed by Jesus' precious blood. Missing the rapture isn't the main issue. The real problem is living through the suffering and pain of the Great Tribulation. It's also the agony of knowing that salvation is free and simple, yet you ignored it. Those who are left behind will have a lot to deal with, and there's no middle ground with the rapture. You're either taken up or left behind. There is no negotiating this. This should also motivate us as believers to share the gospel like never before. God's love is reaching out to all of us now while there's still time. When the Lord's trumpet sounds, the question that'll remain for each of us is, will you be taken up or left behind? When God created Adam and Eve, He provided everything needed for life and dominion on earth. However, they were deceived by Satan and fell from the exalted position God had given them due to their misuse of free will. When God confronted Adam about his sin, He immediately began what we now call the blame game in Genesis 3. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. The simple, often overlooked statement marks the start of the consequences of free will. Though we are created with the freedom to make choices, we will be held accountable for our decisions. Because of Adam's fall and the effect it had on all of us, we're all in desperate need of a savior. But here's the good news. God in his mercy has made a way for us to be restored through Jesus Christ. However, this gift of salvation isn't automatically given to everyone. Have you ever thought about how even though salvation is free for everyone, some people might miss out on God's offer of salvation? It's a pretty mind-boggling concept, right? Well, in today's video, we're going to dive into six groups of people that God can't save. I'm really excited about this discussion because by the end of the video, I believe that you will be blessed and your perspective will be transformed so, buckle up. Before we jump into this, I want to clarify something important. When we talk about God cannot save in this context, it's not about a limit to God's power. God is all-powerful and can do anything. What we're discussing here is the state of the person themselves. It's like saying that if someone continues on a certain path, they're essentially making it impossible for God to save them. So, just to be clear, this has nothing to do with God's ability to save. He can save anyone, anytime, but based on what we know about God from Scripture, we can identify certain types of people that God, as a matter of principle, cannot save. So, let's get into it. 
the six kinds of people that fall into this category. Number one, the reprobate. The reprobates are people who were allowed to be overtaken by depraved minds because of their inability to embrace God's mercy. Romans chapter 1 verses 21 through 22 gives us more details about them. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. The knowledge of God is the ultimate treasure. It's more valuable than anything else in this world, more precious than gold, riches, or wealth. But a lot of folks out there don't realize how precious this knowledge really is. Some even treat it like it's only meant for certain types of people, maybe the less fortunate or those who are seen as super religious. But the hard truth is that those who disregard this treasure will face consequences. God's penalty for them is to essentially let them be consumed by the very things they've chosen over Him. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? These reprobates are choosing to believe a lie rather than God's truth. They're putting their focus on created things instead of the Creator, completely denying God's power even when it's all around them. It's like the Psalms say, only a fool say there's no God. We're seeing a concerning rise in false religion these days, spreading ideas that deny the existence of God and promote all kinds of ungodly stuff. In some places, it's not even about denying God's existence. They're claiming that you're your own God or that there's a God within you. It's leading people down a path where they become reprobates. And once you're in that place, God can't save you because you've shut Him out of your heart and mind. It's heavy stuff, and many shy away from it. But it's important to talk about so that we aren't lured into it. Let's keep going. Number 2. The Self-Righteous Matthew chapter 5, verse 20 reads, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Saints, Jesus really lays it out plainly and simply in this verse. He's letting us know that not everyone who claims to be religious is automatically in God's kingdom. It's a different kind of righteousness that's needed instead of the self-righteousness that comes from trying to follow the rules or do good deeds. Consider the false righteousness we see in the Pharisees, those religious leaders of Jesus' time. Even the least of believers in Christ has a righteousness that surpasses theirs. So, what does God actually require for us to be part of His kingdom? It's a righteousness that comes from having faith in Christ. It's this faith that connects us with Christ and brings His Spirit into our lives. It's not just about being seen as righteous in God's eyes. It also changes us from the inside out, making righteous living possible for us. It's a powerful idea, don't you think? The Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 paints a clear picture of the kind of righteousness that God approves and the kind that He rejects. When our behaviors come from a heart that's been changed by God, it's on a different level than the righteousness that's just surface level, produced by our human nature. What kind of righteousness could we ever produce on our own? Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 puts it in stark terms, saying that all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. It's a powerful reminder of just how much we need God's grace and transformation in our lives. Jesus shares this parable that speaks to those who are pretty sure they had everything together, morally and spiritually speaking, in Luke chapter 18 verses 9 through 14. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Beloved, God cannot save the self-righteous because they trust more in their good works than in Jesus' sacrifice for us. Good works cannot save anyone. Only faith in His sacrifice saves. Now to the third category. Number three, the unbelievers. Let's talk about the unbelievers for a while. Jesus spoke about unbelief several times while He was on earth. John chapter 3, verse 18. 
Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Those who truly believe in Jesus are completely forgiven. Their sins are wiped away by Christ's sacrificial death, and they are seen as innocent and righteous. This means there's no condemnation for them, but it's a different story for unbelievers. It's clear that faith is a huge deal in the teachings of the Bible, and we're reminded in 1 John chapter 5, verse 10, Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar, because they have not believed the testimony God has given about His Son. By refusing to believe, unbelievers turn their backs on God's one and only solution for their sins. In fact, by rejecting God's greatest gift and refusing to believe, they're essentially calling God a liar. If they don't change their ways and embrace the gospel, there's only one outcome for them – condemnation. Number 4. Blasphemers or Apostates Mark chapter 3, verses 28-29 through 29 says, Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins in every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. God is the one who empowers people to repent, and it's the Holy Spirit working in our hearts that guides us towards repentance. But when we resist and refuse to turn from our ways and even speak against God, He won't force us to change. As a result, those who harden their hearts will never repent and, consequently, won't be forgiven. It's important to be mindful of our words and reaction to God's work. Sometimes, it's better to stay silent when we don't fully understand something, rather than speaking without enough knowledge. Just think about how many people dismiss the incredible things God does today, claiming they're fake. When people consistently reject the Holy Spirit's power, it becomes difficult for God to save them from their sins, as the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts people of their wrongdoing. How can He do this when they continually downplay His abilities? It's crucial to remember that the Holy Spirit is fully God and has emotions. He can be deeply hurt by blasphemous statements and disbelief in His power and work. This is a significant reason why many struggle to find salvation. They've been consumed by blasphemy. Number 5. The Hypocrites as described in Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 through 15. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Friends, hypocrites are nothing but impostors. They parade around, claiming virtues they do not possess. What's their goal? To exploit the vulnerable and downtrodden, only to veil their transgressions beneath a facade of religious piety. Moreover, they also strive to discourage others from embracing faith in God. Their religious devotion consists of mere activities, void of genuine devotion. Instead of guiding souls towards God, they seek to make themselves look good and amass followers to their own sect. Such lifestyles, motivated solely by self-aggrandizement, stand as hollow and misguided pursuits, devoid of any alignment with true Christian principles. Reflecting on the Pharisees of old, we witness an illustration of misapplied zealous fervor resulting in disastrous outcomes. Their fervent religious activities yielded followers who were more morally bankrupt than themselves. Hence, Jesus, in no uncertain terms, denounced both these leaders and their converts as progenies of damnation. Regrettably, dear friends, this wicked sin persists today, and it will cause those guilty of it to sink deep into God's condemnation for all eternity if they do not repent. Now. Let us turn our attention to the final kind of people whom God cannot save. Number 6. Those who seek salvation through other means. Friends, even with the widespread reach of the gospel today, thanks to evangelists, missionaries, and social media, there are still people who firmly believe that salvation isn't solely found in Jesus. They acknowledge that humanity needs to be reconciled with God and recognize their helplessness and sin. However, they don't accept that the only path to God is through Jesus Christ alone. 
This is directly addressed by Jesus himself in John chapter 14, verse 6, where he clearly states that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one can come to the Father except through him. My friends, it's important to understand that Jesus isn't just one option among many. He is the only way. While many may struggle with this teaching, our personal preferences won't change this fundamental truth. Instead of resisting it, we should choose to embrace it because Jesus is the embodiment of truth and does not lie. He himself declared that he is the only Son of God, the key to spiritual life, the one we must believe in to avoid being lost forever. He is the sole door for God's people and the only shepherd. Let's put our trust in him, not only because of who he is, but also because of the compelling evidence he has provided. Finally, Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. The apostles shared this teaching because it was passed down to them by Jesus himself. Salvation is a profound concept in the New Testament, encompassing the forgiveness of sins, spiritual rebirth, freedom from the shackles of sin, being deemed righteous by God, and the promise of eternal life in His presence. My dear friend, you can embrace this salvation today. The Bible urges us that, if we hear His voice, we should not harden our hearts. Let's not deliberately choose a path that obstructs God's provision of salvation. Instead, Listen as Jesus knocks at the door of your heart today. You can welcome him in and secure your eternal salvation. You might have encountered some strange occurrences, or you might have heard others talk about seeing things or encountering demons. In this message, I want to use the Bible to help you understand this ancient and complex topic. Can demons truly change their appearance? Are they really showing themselves in the physical world? We'll use the Bible to examine this closely. But before we begin, it's crucial that, as Christians, we accept the finality of Scripture. What do I mean? What is the finality of Scripture? The finality of Scripture means that the Bible is enough as the complete Word of God. It should be enough for us as followers of Christ in all aspects of our lives. God's Word is the ultimate authority on any matter no matter what it is. Those who believe that human opinions and agreement can override God's Word are mistaken. We may hear many views on a subject, but the final say hasn't been given until we hear from God. This means that we can turn to the Bible for guidance on any topic, including demons. Saints, the Bible is a fascinating book that covers a vast range of topics on human life and existence, ranging from love and compassion to spiritual beings and demonic entities. However, have you ever wondered if the Bible suggests that demons can transform physically from one form to another? Well, here's the thing. While the Bible talks about demonic possession, it does not explicitly state that demons can turn a human into a dog or a cat. This idea is not supported in the Bible. The demons described in the Bible are purely spiritual and non-physical beings. This means that the demons are immaterial, but we can feel them when they move around us. That's what I mean when I say demons are immaterial creatures. Now, it's important to understand that the spiritual realm is different from the physical world we live in. In the physical world, for instance, many things like time, space, and gravity have a significant impact on our lives. However, in the spiritual realm, these things don't apply. They simply don't exist. This means that the natural laws governing our physical world are different from those in the spiritual world. That's why it may not be accurate to say that demons can change their shape like we see in horror movies. Understanding the world in which demons live can be challenging because the rules that govern their world are not the same as ours. Since demons are not physical things, it's likely that they can transform themselves this means it's possible for them to disguise themselves in a way that confuses our understanding of their existence. Consider what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. 
their end will be what their actions deserve. In this verse, we learn that Satan doesn't show up waving a Hello, I'm Satan banner. No, he's sly. Instead of making sin and evil look all bad, he puts on this dazzling act. Picture it. He shines, sparkles, and seems downright charming. He disguises himself as a god, making rebelliousness to God's word sound pretty reasonable and turning sin into something that looks like it's all good. His game plan is to flip things around, making what's true seem false, turning sinfulness into what looks right, and making the dark seems like it's shining brighter than the light. A lot of people are unaware that Satan can be very deceitful to achieve his goals. Sometimes he hides behind a facade of kindness to gain people's trust, only to strike once he's in their midst. This has been a strategy since he deceived Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He used it again to deceive David to take a census of Israel, even though God had commanded against doing so. It's a simple yet powerful tactic. Consider this for a moment. Have you ever wondered why there are so many false religions around the world today? The straightforward answer is because of the devil's deception. He is very cunning, and so are his demons. Let's look at a passage from Paul's letter to the Galatians 1, 8, and 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Friends, have you ever wondered why many false religions started with an encounter with some angelic being? It's quite intriguing, isn't it? But the truth is that these so-called angels may not be what they appear. In fact, they could be demons disguising themselves as angels of light just to deceive the founders of these false religions. Think about it for a moment. If you were the devil, would you appear to people dressed in black with two horns, four eyes, two tongues, and a long tail? Of course not. That would be too obvious. Instead, the devil comes as an angel of light with a distorted truth. It's a simple scheme, but a very dangerous one. This is why the Bible strongly warns that if anyone preaches a gospel different than what Jesus and the apostles taught, let them be cursed. Did you know that some popular religions in the world today began with the claim that angels brought them divine revelations about God and how to worship Him? It's true that, according to the Bible in Hebrews 13, we must not forget to show kindness to strangers, as they might be angels in disguise. We also know that angels are real, and one of their tasks is to minister to those of us who have received salvation. As stated in Hebrews 1.14, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Today, there are many religions around the world with millions of followers that were founded on false claims of divine visitations by supposed angels. As a result of these visits, they were introduced to satanic doctrines and vices that promote the worship of Satan. Friends, Lucifer, who is now Satan, has always been a deceiver. Jesus speaks to this in John 8, 44. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. There is no truth in him, my dear friend, if he was able to deceive one-third of the angels in heaven to join him in a rebellion against God, then we must be aware of his cunning deception. The name Lucifer means light-bearer, and it's no wonder he knows how to transform into an angel of light at any time. However, we can be certain that he is not of the light. Consider the vision of John the Beloved in Revelation 22, 8 and 9. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said, Don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you, and with your fellow prophets, and with all who keep the words of this scroll. Worship God. 
Here, we can clearly see the most significant difference between angels and demons. It's the angel's nature to absolutely reject worship, because worship belongs to God. However, it's the demon's nature to ask for and accept worship. In fact, Satan and his angels crave worship. Now, why did I spend so much time on Satan's character? It's quite simple, because all his demons take after him. They directly reflect anything they see him do as their master. They all have the same nature as their master. This is why the Apostle John teaches that we should not be surprised that Satan can outwardly change himself to become an angel of light. When you hear people claiming to have some kind of encounter, I advise you to be careful because these dreams, visions, or encounters may not be true. Do not just accept everything that they say to you because, sometimes, these encounters are inspired by demons and not God. Similarly, all demons are deceitful. They may not necessarily change their physical appearance, but they can alter the perspective of those they want to deceive. The Antichrist will do the same during the end times, deceiving many to take the mark of the beast. Beloved, there is a great battle going on in the spiritual realm between the forces of evil and good, deception and truth, darkness and light. You must be equipped with the knowledge of this warfare so you are not a victim of the enemy's manipulation. When we talk about different forms demons might take, it's not so much about a physical change, but more about how they manipulate things. Shape-shifting isn't about transforming their appearance, it's about sly and clever adjustments in how people see or experience these demons in real life. Apart from being able to pretend to be angels of light, demons can also take control of people. For example, think about the story of the madman in Gadarenes from Mark 5, 1-20. The Bible repeatedly tells of how Jesus encountered people who were demon-possessed in his earthly ministry. The story of the man from Gadarenes, possessed by demons, shows us that demons have a strong and passionate desire to inhabit human or even animal bodies. This story also reveals that demons prefer to dwell in bodies or to roam about the earth rather than being sent to hell, where they actually belong. By possessing bodies, they can have a physical presence in this world, causing harm and chaos. In Matthew 12, 43 through 45, Jesus shared a powerful lesson. He explained that if a demon gets cast out and returns to find the person empty, it comes back with seven even stronger demons to take over. That's why it's crucial to let Jesus fill your heart and to stay faithful, keeping yourself filled with His Spirit. As Paul wisely advises in Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Here's the good news, though. A demon can't possess a true Christian. Why not? Because the genuine Spirit of Light is already dwelling within them, making it impossible for the Spirit of Darkness to coexist. It's a reassuring truth for those walking in the light of faith. Yet today, many people do not believe in the existence of demons. Some see them as fabricated lies meant to keep people in bondage to religious practices or in fear. However, the Bible teaches and confirms that demons are real spiritual beings. They exist with the goal of assisting Satan in destroying people's lives by turning them against God, oppressing and manipulating them. Saints, the idea of demonic shape-shifting, often portrayed in movies and literature, has no basis in the Bible. Demons are spiritual beings and do not possess bodies that would allow them to change their physical form. However, they can deceive people by appearing to them as angels of light or as advocates of truth. Their ability to change is not physical, but rather spiritual, aimed at leading people into error. Therefore, as believers, it's important for us to remain steadfast and vigilant using God's Word as our main reference to discern such matters that concern demonic sightings around us. Nevertheless, it's crucial to remember that when we believe in Jesus, we have authority over demons, regardless of their ability to change form. 
This is the inheritance of every believer, as Jesus confirms in Mark 16, 17. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. What a glorious inheritance we have in Jesus! Indeed, we have no reason to fear or allow ourselves to be deceived by Satan's lies. The Greater One lives in us and works in us, empowering us to both detect and overcome every demon that stands before us. In the annals of faith, the whispers of the end times have always echoed through the ages, painting the horizon with hues of hope and caution. Take a glance back and you'll find believers across eras, gazing at the skies, deciphering signs, and marking calendars. Among them, radio preacher Harold Camping's voice resonated far and wide, casting a spell of urgency as he heralded the closing of an epoch in May 2011. Though the sun rose as usual the next day, the seed of reflection was sown. Now, let's voyage through the scriptures, into the heart of prophecies where the silhouettes of the times to come are sketched. The sacred text, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, unveils a dialogue about the end of the world, a finale to the present reality, dubbed as the last days or end times, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, and Daniel chapter 8, verse 19. A somber yet enlightening narrative, it unveils the tapestry of global events, attitudes, and a shift in core human values as the curtain of the present era quivers in the breeze of change. Amidst the swirl of earthly chaos, have you noticed unique kinds of individuals emerging from the corners of the globe? Their essence is different. Their hearts beat to a rhythm of change. They stand as living testaments to the unfolding script of the end times. Picture the globe as a giant canvas. Now, amidst the common strokes, these individuals paint with colors bold and divine. They carry a signature of higher truth, their actions echoing the ancient scriptures. Let's delve into a few signposts marking their journey. Firstly, the emergence of widespread conflict as foretold by Jesus. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Matthew chapter 24, verse 7. The imagery of Revelation chapter 6, verse 4 unveils a symbolic horseman, a harbinger of wars, draining peace from the earth's veins. Yet amid the cacophony of battles, these individuals rise, not with swords, but with love, understanding, and an unwavering faith. They embody the essence of a higher calling, their lives mirroring the celestial harmony amidst earthly discord. Their appearance isn't a call to despair, but a beacon of hope, a promise of a divine script unfolding. Every challenge they face, every act of love they bestow, echoes the profound transition a divine choreography leading towards a grand celestial crescendo. As you traverse your path, observe the signs, recognize the faces of the divine narrative unfolding. These aren't mere coincidences, but meticulously placed pieces of a grand puzzle. Each act of love, every stand for truth, mirrors the essence of the scriptures, a herald to the resonating tune of the end times. In the growing shadows of the present days, we discern a pattern unfolding, reminiscent of the days of yore described in our timeless scriptures. Across the globe, a unique breed of individuals emerges, heralding the whisper of the biblical end times. It's unfolding in the headlines, in the strife that paints our world with shades of uncertainty, the skirmishes in the ancient lands, the distant rumble of discord between nations like Russia and Ukraine, the heart-wrenching tales from Israel, they're not just mere occurrences, but a mirror reflecting the stirring of a divine narrative. Now, when the storm clouds of divine adjudication gathered in the biblical days, a profound narrative of separation played out, preserving the righteous from the tempest of divine wrath. This narrative is not just a tale of yore, but a living testament to the enduring mercy and love that cushions the hearts of the faithful, even as the storm rages around. Consider the epoch of Noah, when the earth was swathed in moral decay, a divine distinction shielded Noah and his kin from the deluge that cleansed the earth. Their ark wasn't just a vessel of wood and nails, it was a sanctuary of hope amidst a tempest of judgment. Then there's the tale of Sodom and Gomorrah, sights veiled in wickedness, yet amidst the darkness, 
Lot and his family found a divine escort guiding them away from the inferno that engulfed the wicked cities. It was a manifest testament to the divine assurance that even amidst the roaring fires of judgment, the path of escape is carved for the righteous. Let's stroll through the annals of time to the shores of the Red Sea. With the mighty Pharaoh and his army in relentless pursuit, the children of Israel stood at the threshold of hope and despair. And then, the divine choreography unfolded, waters parted, making a path of deliverance for the righteous. The instant they crossed to safety, the waters roared back, engulfing the foes in a watery grave. These aren't mere stories, but echoes of a divine promise that reverberates through time, whispering to our hearts today. As we navigate through the turbulent tides of modern times, witnessing the emergence of distinct individuals worldwide, the narrative of divine separation is not just a comforting notion, but an enduring promise to those who anchor their hopes in the divine. The biblical end times narrative isn't a tale of despair, but a clarion call to align our hearts, to discern the unfolding narrative, and to embrace the promise of divine separation. It's a journey of hope, a celebration of divine love that cradles the righteous even when the storm howls around. As we ponder on these unfolding events, let's anchor our hearts in the scripture. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The promise is clear. The narrative is unfolding. And in the symphony of divine love, there's a place of hope and safety for the righteous. The scriptures in Matthew chapter 24, verse 7 hinted at times of scarcity, a world where sustenance becomes a luxury rather than a guarantee. And here we are, witnessing a world grappling with food shortages, each day becoming a solemn reminder of the words echoed in the holy texts. In Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 through 6, an allegory of famine rides through the land on the back of a symbolic horseman, its journey leaving behind trails of hunger and despair on a monumental scale. The narrative isn't just ink on parchment, but is mirrored in the hollow eyes of the hungry and the cries of the famished that reverberate through the heavens. The earth, too, trembles with the burden of these unfolding times, as seismic whispers shatter the silence in one place after another. Matthew chapter 24, verse 7. Luke chapter 21, verse 11. The ground beneath us isn't just a mere bystander. It too participates in this cosmic play, narrating tales of the times through tremors and quakes. Now, let's talk about a plague not of the body, but of the soul, a disease spreading through the veins of morality. The scriptures warned us of a time when hearts would turn cold, when deceit and falsehood would be worshiped, and a guise of righteousness would veil the intentions of the wicked. Luke chapter 21, verse 11. The emergence of those whose hearts are veiled with pride, idolatry, and a distorted sense of morality is no longer a tale of the distant future, but a reality we witness daily. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20 casts a warning to those who switch the moral compass, who blur the lines between right and wrong, who exchange the sweetness of truth from the bitterness of lies. These individuals, some adorned with fame and authority, parade falsehood with a sprinkle of truth, misleading many. Amidst this unfolding narrative, we are not merely spectators, but participants. It's a call to remain steadfast, to nurture the light of truth, love, and humility within us. The scriptures are not just a window to the past, but a mirror reflecting the reality of the present and a lens peering into what lies ahead. The choice is ours whether to be swept away in the tide of deception or to anchor ourselves in the eternal truths that have navigated believers through the sands of time. The scriptures are not silent about such times. They beckon us to a higher awareness, to a greater vigilance. The words in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, resonate more than ever. As it mentions, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Today, the shadows of this prophecy stretch far and wide across the globe. The essence of righteousness is traded for a facade of benevolence, a guise that charms many. Now, let's delve a little into the annals of history, a time when idolatry was blatant. The crafting of gods from earthly materials was a norm. Fast forward to our era, 
we find a subtler yet profound form of idolatry nesting in the hearts of many. Our modern day idols may not be forged from bronze or silver, but from the desires and ideologies we hold dear. The throne that should be reserved for the divine is often occupied by our careers, relationships, or even political inclinations. We live amidst a generation where a diluted gospel, sweet to the ears yet devoid of the soul-stirring call to repentance, finds many takers. The essence of carrying one's cross, of crucifying the flesh, is glossed over. Lost in the loud cheers for a grace that requires nothing of us. Yet the profound truth remains that a transformative grace calls us into a journey of righteousness, a path often less trodden. As the earth groans under the weight of violence, corruption, and blatant disregard for its sanctity, the words in Revelation chapter 11 verse 18 seem to echo louder. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. The earth too bears the brunt of a civilization lost in the abyss of self-indulgence. Among the silhouettes of these times, a cold-hearted persona emerges, devoid of the warmth of love. The ancient verses of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 through 3, paints a vivid picture of this persona, consumed by self-love, material pursuits, and an absence of tender affection. As wealth amasses, love diminishes, casting a frost over the heart, rendering it indifferent to the plights of others. This cold-heartedness manifests not only in the indifference to fellow beings, but stretches its icy fingers into the sacred bonds of family. As foretold in the scriptures, love that once bloomed naturally within kin now withers. Children, once the bearers of obedience and respect, drift into rebellion against the elders. Our journey through these verses unveils a stark contrast between the divine virtues of love, compassion, and the emerging cold-heartedness. It's a voyage that calls for self-reflection, urging us to seek the warmth of love amidst an encroaching coldness. An awakening beckons as we decipher these signs, urging us to foster love, kindness, and uphold the sanctity of family, defending against the icy winds of indifference. It's a call to action, a call to delve within and shatter the invisible idols, to let warmth of love dissolve the coldness enveloping hearts, reinstating the divine virtues that once held humanity together. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, Jesus laid bare a bitter truth, stating, the love of the greater number will grow cold. But this coldness isn't just towards our fellow humans. It extends towards our love for the divine, replacing the holy with the ephemeral. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4 articulates this further, saying in the last days, many would become lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. Now, let's traverse this journey of understanding together, shedding light on the characteristics of individuals emerging in these pivotal times. We see a shift from love and forgiveness to resentment and revenge. A grudge held is like a burning coal clutched tightly in one's hand. It's not just the offender who gets burned, but the one holding on to it. Forgiveness isn't just a divine virtue, but a release for our souls from the shackles of bitterness. Now, let's delve into the realm of pride, a deceptive veil that binds individuals to their own shortcomings, breeding a culture of comparison and discontent. Wealth, vanity, and worldly achievements become the measuring stick of worth. Rather than the love and humility Christ exemplified, pride not only eclipses God's glory, but creates fissures in our human connections. Furthermore, the masquerade of religious hypocrisy begins to take center stage. Individuals may don a facade of worship, but their lives reflect a stark deviation from the divine standards. Worship isn't just about utterances of praise, but a life reflective of God's love and humility. The scriptures aren't just ancient texts, but a mirror reflecting the state of our hearts and the world around us. In the face of these emerging behaviors, we're not called to despair, but to light the torch of love, humility, and true worship, illuminating the dark crevices of the world with hope.